one. Let's refresh our memories. Let's turn to the psalm, Psalm 91. So far we've been helped from the themes of the psalm, like this. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. We have the warm and comfortable promise of privacy in our relationship with the Lord God. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him will I trust. Where we see the psalmist's own experience of perseverance as he trusted God. And then there's the deliverance promise in verse 3. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and the noisome pestilence. The protection promise in verse 4. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler, reminding ourselves of the watchfulness of our dear Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then fifthly came the promise of preservation, God's remedy for fear. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, and nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. And then God's providence seen in verses 9 to 10. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. The Lord our refuge and our provider. And then seventhly, the promise of the power of his angels. Verse 11, he shall give his angels charge over thee, to keep thee in all thy ways, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. And then, as we saw last Lord's Day, God's promise of prevailing over the soul's enemies. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. And so, tonight we come to the I wills of God's promise the I wills of God's promise in Psalm 91. And there are seven I will statements in these last three verses. And here they are in verses 14 to 16. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, these last three verses introduce us to a different kind of voice. All of the psalm is the voice of our Saviour God speaking to us as his beloved children. First 13 verses have spoken to us in an assuring tone of God's protection with its many aspects that we've just listed together. But now, verses 14 and 16, we find a more personal tone. The Lord Jesus himself comes and pledges now to watch over us and care for us. And we could call the earlier promises, these first eight sort of general promises, while these in the last three verses are more intimate. It's as if the Lord has left the best to last. David Dixon in his famous commentary on the Psalms says that this last motive to believe in God is spoken by God the Father of his Son the Lord Jesus Christ as a man and of every believer and every true member of the body of Christ. So speaking of Christ as a man and speaking as us, as men and women, an intimate relationship here. The psalmist addresses him here in the text. Notice that here. Because he has set his love upon me, I will deliver him. I will set him on high 
He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. With long life will I satisfy him. That means the person addressed in verse 1, the believer. And who is that? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That is the him, or her of course, indeed. And we keep that in mind as we look at these seven I wills in our passage tonight. Now most believers will know of the I wills of the Lord Jesus Christ that occur in the Gospels, in his word of ministry. But here let us know the seven I wills in Psalm 91. And I've arranged them uh, as we think about them with the I will statement coming first in each occasion. So verse 14 Therefore I will deliver him because he, the Lord and the believer, has set his love upon me. Secondly, I will set him on high because he has known my name. Thirdly, verse 15, I will answer him because he shall call upon me. And then also in verse 15, I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. Verse 16, I will satisfy him with long life and I will show him my salvation. Now this is a wonderful bunch of I wills. We've got some bunch of tulips here. But you know, this is a bunch of I wills, seven of them. From the mouth and the heart of our gracious Lord God. So may we draw from them help and comfort this evening. We can see immediately and obviously that the Lord God the Father easily applies these seven to his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The Saviour loved the Father and declared that love. John 15, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. And that is a wonderful expression. And we read more of the love of the Saviour for his people and their love for him, and Christ's love for his Father in John 14 earlier. God set his love on his Son. How could he not? The Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is a lovely person, one who can be loved. He was the only begotten Son of the Father, precious to God the Father. But here in our first I will, we have, therefore, I will deliver him because he has set his love upon me. And so now the text addresses us, we who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have already come across deliverance in this psalm, which took us back to the history of Israel, when they had been delivered from Egypt by God's mighty hand. There they were, after 400 years, in the depths of despair, under the awful, awful time of, the, of, of uh, slavery under the Egyptians. And God sent Moses to deliver them into the wilderness and ultimately to Canaan. Moses is often seen as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, delivering his people rescuing us, delivering us from the consequences of our sins and the also awful ultimate consequence of sin if it remains unforgiven. And they escaped, these Israelites, from the slavery of Pharaoh and his taskmasters. And we escape the slavery of sin and of Satan. And my friends, our deliverance is supernatural. There was something supernatural in the way that Israel got out, going through the Red Sea. Water's parting and them going forward on dry land. The sea's coming back again on Pharaoh and his hosts, destroying them all. There's a supernatural evidence of that. And through their care in the wilderness, we also have a supernatural experience when we're converted, when we become Christians. We had no power to rescue ourselves from the dark state of sin. Israel had no power to rescue themselves out of the clutches of Pharaoh and his people. It needed a miracle, and God the Holy Spirit is a worker of miracles. He raises dead souls to life. And why have we, who are Christians, been delivered? Why? Ever ask that question? 
We have the answer here. One answer. God set his love upon us from the foundation of the world. Yes, this is a New Testament doctrine found here at the end of Psalm 91. That doctrine, so well expounded in Christ's words in Matthew 25, 34, Then shall the sick king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That preparedness is God setting his love upon his people. In Ephesians 1.4, we're so familiar with it, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, chosen in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. But wonder of wonders, that teaching is here in Psalm 91, because he has set his love upon us, or upon me, as it says here in the intimate sense of God speaking here because he has set his love upon me oh my dear brother or sister this is most remarkable God has chosen us in order to set his love upon us God has become attached to me attached to you he has united himself with me. He is my friend. He is your friend if you are a believer tonight. The Hebrew word expresses the strongest attachment and it's equivalent to the expression to fall in love. This is amazing. We talk of ourselves becoming in love with the Lord God, with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But here it is God setting his love upon me. He is loving me. Sometimes it is too much for us to get over it, is it? Because we feel so unlovely. We know we're rebels by nature. We know we're sinners. We know we deserve nothing of God's love or his choosing or his setting his love upon us. But here we have it in scripture. We can take it for ourselves. He has set his love upon me. And the fact that God is the object of supreme affection on the part of his people, but also here it implies that this springs from our hearts and that we've seen such beauty in his character and of such strong desire for him that our hearts go out in warm affection to him. Why? Because he has set his love upon us first. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? Oh, what we have to be grateful for. Well, do we love the Lord God and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, with the strength of love that he has shown to us? If we knew someone who had offended us over and over again, someone who insulted us, someone who ignored us, denied us, someone who did not have us in any regard at all but despised us would we love that person how could we it goes against our very nature but God has set his love on us even that while we were yet sinners he sent his son to die for us so do we love him with that strength of love that he has shown to us he has fixed his love on us can we ask ourselves, have we fixed our love on him? We are delivered. We are delivered because he loved us. How does that make us feel, brothers and sisters? Should it not fill our hearts with joy and devotion to our great Saviour? I will deliver, he says, meaning I will deliver and save my believing child from troubles, temptations and evils of all kinds, so that the child of God will not be destroyed by them. That's what he means here, because he set his love upon us, so he won't let it happen. Remember Psalm 34, verse 19, says by way of confirmation for us, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivereth him out of them all. I will deliver the believer in Jesus says the Lord God, 
because he has set his love upon me. We must move on. The second I will. I will set him on high because he has known my name. Now the next promise is connected to the knowledge of God, his attributes and the Saviour, the knowledge of the Saviour. Now to know someone's name is an act of familiarity. To forget someone's name can often result in offence. It can even indicate a disregard for that person, except for the fact that as we age and get older, we find remembering people's names, even those with whom we have been very familiar in the past, a difficulty. Yes, we all have to suffer from that, a bit of a problem. I find it increasingly a handicap, but the very last name that if I've got to forget any names, the very last name that I want to forget is the name of my Saviour, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. How can I forget his name? His name so precious, that lovely name, the sweetest name on earth, the name of Jesus, the best name, the name above every name. Jesus' name is very wonderful. We sang in the Sunday school, didn't we? We sang of his love that was very wonderful but also his name is very wonderful it's a wonderful name and now the I will in this section indicates a place of safety I will deliver him I will set him on high I will set him on high now the Israelites when they occupied Jerusalem felt very safe why was that because you see, even though I've not been there, I understand that Jerusalem is a very high city, set upon a great mound of rock called Moriah, which is impregnable almost. It is high, and is a city set on high. It had a commanding view of the approaches to the city, those slopes that the pilgrims came up when they came for the feast days. You had to climb up a mountain to get to the city. And this is reflected in several texts, places, of safety. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. Such towers that were spoken of in Proverbs were very high, usually in the midst, in the middle of a village, and they were the safe place. Psalm 61 verse 3, thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. It's the knowledge of this tower that sets us running to it. And so the idea of being set on high here is not that we'll be exalted in some way, that we'll go up a few notches in, in the social pattern of things. No, it's not that. It's that we will be secure and safe. Secure and safe. I will set him on high, out of harm's way which fits so well under the notion of being under his wings and safety and in the refuge. <laughs> now there's another aspect of the Christian being set on high. It's God acknowledging us humble believers in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as his own. That's what I meant about the intimacy of these I wills. God's saying that we are his own. And when God does that, he treats us as sons and daughters with a special place in his heart. But more than this, the Lord says, I will set them apart from the dangers, out of the reach of enemies. I will honour and ennoble this child of mine because he or she has known my name because he has loved and honoured and served me. Rendered me that worship which is my due. He has known me to be the God of infinite mercy, of loving kindness. I wonder if you've seen that here, this love of God. Seen it like this, have you realised, precious child of the Most High, that's what you are, that he has lifted you up to a high status because 
you have known him. That's what it is. I will set him on high in a place of safety. I will set him on high. Thirdly, I will answer him. Because he shall call upon me. The beginning of verse 15. Oh, the Lord God promises this, my friends. That I will listen to his supplications, says the Lord God. And I will grant his requests. Oh, there could be no greater privilege nor precious, precious promise than this. You know, we are waiting for an answer to a letter sent by 120 evangelical ministers sent to the Prime Minister, Mr. Johnson. Ministers of the Gospel who have asked the Prime Minister to consider calling a national day of prayer to God. Oh, my friends, the silence is deafening. The lack of response is tragic. Not so with God, my friends. Not so with him. I will answer, says the Lord. When the believer calls upon the Lord, he can be guaranteed, she can be guaranteed an answer. And it may not be what we expect or desire, but he will answer. Now we need to believe this, and believe it quite surely. Let's not get confused here. Answer does not always mean grant the request. An answer can be a refusal. An answer can be an explanation. An answer can be a conditional grant. That is, if you will do this, then I will do that, says God. For instance, we can think of Solomon's prayer in the dedication of the temple in 2 Chronicles 7. Brought this response from the Lord God. If my people, says the Lord God to Solomon, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. We need that to be quoted more and more at the moment as we're in this pandemic situation. But it is a conditional answer. If my people will do that, then will I hear from heaven. That's an answer. So let's be wise in our prayers. Let's be expectant that God will answer whatever they turn out to be. So Christians, first of all, are called by God. And after that, when they are converted, they call upon God. That is prayer. Whatever happens, God is true to his word. I will answer him. I will never fail. I am utterly dependable, says the Lord God. Fourthly, I will be with him in trouble. In dire circumstances, the Lord God says, I will stand by him. I will not forsake him. Thomas Watson asks, God will hold our hand and our heart when we are fainting, what if we have more afflictions than others? If it means that we will have more of God's company. You understand what we're saying there? Afflictions are permitted, allowed and even sent by the Lord. And sometimes they are there to cause us to call upon him, to cry to him and to have more of his company. For those who are suffering right now, who are calling upon the Lord and crying to him to be near. And he is answering by being there to them. They can feel it. That's an amazing thought. A mighty promise concerning God's nearness and presence. If we are to suffer a furnace of affliction, it's all the more bearable when we know that we have the Lord Jesus near us. With me in trouble, he says here, I wonder if you need this tonight, my friend. How do you know that God will be with you in trouble? If trouble is going to come, if trouble is round the corner for you, how do you know Jesus will be with you? Because of his promises, which are dependable. His promises which will never fail. He stimulates hope by his promises to be with us. 
What is his name? Emmanuel, which means God with us. The Lord Jesus Christ with us. That title is not just for Christmas, my friends. It's for every moment. When an angel came to Mary to tell her of her child Jesus, he says, Hail, thou who art highly favoured. Remember what he said next. The Lord is with thee. Psalm 23 is so familiar to us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So many times in scripture the Lord is said to be with his people. Nationally with his people. Individually with his people. And it's a great blessing when that is true. And it's experienced. So we need to hang on to these truths, my friends. Who knows what troubles are around the corner. I will be with him in trouble. What trouble? Maybe we don't have trouble right now. But maybe it's coming. Hang on then. As we thought last Tuesday in the Bible study, Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world or the end of the age. We thought two weeks ago of the angels and their ministry that God has charged them to keep us and help us. You know, sometimes when we are in some trouble, the Lord God says to the angels, move over. I will deal with this personally. I will come to that saint, to that dear one, that beloved child of God, and I will see to it. I will take care of this. I will take care of my loved ones myself and will be with them in trouble. It's not that the angels are not competent, but he chooses to come himself and reveals his presence to us in that particular trouble. I wonder if you've experienced that. Some have, and some can thank the Lord for it. So the Lord speaks to us in his word, the familiar Isaiah 43. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. I will be with thee in trouble. How many of us have gone through trouble like this and found the Lord to be there with us. I will be with him. Moving on to the fifth. I will. I will deliver him and honour him. Well, already we've had the theme of deliverance. We had it earlier in the psalm. We had it even in the I will earlier on of deliverance. But now the Lord adds the thought of honour. The Lord God says, I will not only rescue him from danger, but I will exalt him to honour. I will recognise him as my friend. I will regard and treat him as such. To have the honour of knowing the Lord God intimately and personally. On earth, he shall be treated of my, as my friend. But in the next world, in heaven, he shall be exalted to honour among the redeemed and become the associate of holy beings forever. This is amazing that God should want to honour any of us. Now the world here honours Values the honours that the state can give and the sovereign as she recognises public service. And that is the way our, our uh, society runs. You know, there are far more valuable honours to re be received by the children of God when they get to glory. When they get to that place where Jesus is. No, we don't know, need to know what they are. Just to know that God here says that we shall be honoured. There will be no competition in heaven. There will be no greater honours or lesser honours. Because all of us will receive the same honour. 
It will not mark us out as different, but as the same. The same recipients of the love and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in his glory. You see, we shall share his glory. The scripture says that. That is an honour in itself. And it will be an honour, my brothers and sisters, to depart and be with Christ contentedly and at God's good pleasure. It will be an honour to be recognised as children of the King. That is far more valuable than any prince or princess descended from any earthly monarch. I will deliver and honour him. And then sixthly, in verse 16, I will satisfy him with long life. And uh, the meaning of the original words here is length of days. I will satisfy him with length of days. That is, days lengthened out or multiplied. And the meaning is, I will give him length of days as he desires, or until he is satisfied with life. Which implies that it's natural to desire long life. I think all of us do that. People want to live as long as they can. It seems to be part of our self-preservation instinct that God has hardwired us with. We want to live to a good age. The scripture often notes that having a long life or, or dying full of days is a good thing. That long life is to be regarded as a blessing. Remember how Solomon advises his son in Proverbs 3, My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments for length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Length of days is in her right hand, that is wisdom's right hand, and in her left hand riches and honour. You might recall that the fifth commandment, the commandment to honour father and mother, has a condition with it. That if you honour your father and your mother, your days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now the tendency of a Christian profession is to lengthen out life. The characteristics in the Christian of truthfulness and self-control and temperance and hard work and calmness of mind, moderation in all things and freedom from excesses in eating and drinking, they all contribute to health and to lengthen day, length of days unless the Lord takes us through some illness or some accident. But in the Christian's life, the time will come, even under this promised blessing of length of days, when a man or a woman will be satisfied with living. They will have no strong desire to live longer. When they're under the influence of advancing years, and under the feelings from the fact that their friends have gone in front of them, and under the influence of this glorious and wonderful hope of heaven, then he'll feel that he has had enough of life here and that it is better to depart to the next world and to be with Christ. I will satisfy him, it says here. Some may be feeling this now. We don't get younger, we all get older. But the Lord has kept us here a little longer Let's exercise patience for God's glory. I will satisfy him. And then finally, I will show him my salvation. My friends, this is the greatest climax of blessing in this precious Psalm 91. It includes everything and concludes everything that has been said. What God does, he does perfectly. And we as believers have caught glimpses of the great salvation provided by the Lord God through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his death on the cross, and his rising again. And the Holy Spirit has revealed it to us as believers, step by step in our Christian lives, through the Word of God. And it has taught us, and we have rejoiced in the light of the Gospel. We see the Lord Jesus Christ made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. We have been shown this salvation. How have we seen it? Well, God has given us spiritual eyes to understand. He opened our eyes by the Holy Spirit, whereas the eyes of so many around us are closed. They do not understand the gospel 
and do not want to. And so we've been shown this salvation. As Paul says, we see everything in part, but we do not see yet everything of this great salvation. There's more to see. And one day when we get there to the presence of the king, we will see God's salvation. I will show him my salvation. We have been shown the salvation of God here to a small part. There is more. The Bible says so. I will show him my salvation in a greater part, in a more excellent view we will have, because God will be revealed in all his fullness and glory, and we will then, when we're in heaven with new bodies, with new eyes, we'll be able to bear the glory of the sight of it, which at the moment, if we saw him, we would be shriveled up by the glory of it all in these mortal bodies that we have, but with the new bodies, with the new eyes, the new appreciation of his salvation, the new appreciation of who he is, of his attributes, of his divine majesty, the King of Kings, we shall see more of that salvation. And what we've seen here will be just a small part. There is more to see. It's exciting, isn't it? We're going to see it when we see the King. I wonder if we're ready for that. It's far beyond what we could even think or even desire. And so these promises are for believers. And if you're watching tonight and or whatever day it is that you're watching and you're not yet a believer, then I recommend to you that you call upon the Lord Jesus Christ and seek him with all your heart and seek him in repentance and seek him to forgive your sins and give you this glimpse of glory that we who are believers can see by the Holy Spirit. Because, my friend, you're missing out. You're missing out if you leave this until a more convenient time for you. Call on the Lord Jesus. Seek his pardon. He will grant you mercy. He will grant you his peace if you just come and ask him and confess your sins. Oh, may the Lord bless these thoughts from this beautiful psalm, this lovely psalm. May we encourage one another in reminding each other of these things in our Christian lives, because it is for the glory of the one under whose wings we have come to trust. Amen. Let's pray together.